Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here today with a really special book for our next picture book biography to celebrate Black History Month. Today we are learning about Ashley Bryan, but the really cool thing about this book is that it is not just a biography, it's an autobiography. So a biography is the story of a real person's life, whereas an autobiography is the story of a real person's life written by that person. So this book is written by Ashley Bryan, who is, as it says here, a three-time Coretta Scott King Award winner, because he's a really great illustrator, and you'll see some of his illustrations in here. Um, another really cool thing is that Ashley Bryan lived in Maine as well. So let's go ahead and find out a little more about Ashley, La Ashley Bryan in his book, Words to My Life's Song. Ashley Bryan, Words to My Life Song. This is by Anthem Books for Young Readers. Here's Ashley Bryan. I cannot remember a time when I have not been drawing and painting. In an early photo of my family, I am sitting on my mother's lap. My older brother, Sydney, stands with a bag in his hand. If you put a paintbrush in my hand, that would best complete the picture. The sun, mor the morning sun, jewels the dewdrops in the glass. Walk with me on this main island where I now live as I tell my story. Down the road is a sandy beach lined with boathouses. I have a sketch pad in hand. I was the second of six children, four boys and two girls, growing up in the Bronx in New York City. We lived in a walk-up apartment, buildings four or five stories high. The apartments were called railroad apartments because they went in a straight line from one room to the other. There was a window overlooking the street, an air shaft in the middle, a fire escape on the back window. In good weather, we often sat on the fire escape. This was the Depression era. Wandering musicians performed in the backyard. We'd wrap a few spare coins and newspaper and toss them down in banks. When I was 12, three cousins came to live with us when their mother died. It was like getting three new siblings. Yes, it was quite a crowd, but my mother made our apartment so beautiful that everyone enjoyed visiting. She loved flowers, and whenever there was light, there was a plant. Where there was no light, she made a colorful crepe paper flowers to brighten the shadowed area. We children spun green paper strands around the wire stem that held the flower heads. My parents saw how much I loved drawing and painting and helped with the flowers, so one day they brought home a small desk with cubby holes and drawers for my artwork and materials. I'd sit at that desk in the corner while my brothers and sisters would be dancing to the music of popular songs or playing games of checkers, tiddlywinks, or pickup sticks, laughing and chatting all the while. Sometimes I'd join in, but usually I'd draw away in my private world as if I were in my own quiet studio. During the Great Depression, people were poor, but the government offered free art and music classes around the country. My parents set us out to these WPA, Works Progress Administration, classes saying, learn to entertain yourselves. And we did. We drew, we painted, we played musical instruments. I remember the art teacher, Mr. Margolis, who introduced us to the work of the Impressionist Artist, which opened a whole new world of working in color for me. Like most children, I started by paying, painting a red apple, a solid red. Now I began to play with contrasting colors to enhance the red of the apple. We walked to the beach, small figures in the open space of sky and sea. Before us, the tide rolls in. Each expiring wave brings new treasure. Boats at anchor sway on their moorings. Bright yellow goldfinches hop in and out of the rose bushes that line the shore. Here are some woodcuts by Ashley Bryan. My dad loved birds. Our living room was lined with shelves for bird cages. One time I counted over 100 birds, canaries, finches, warblers, parakeets. My mother would say, if you want any attention around here, you have to get in a cage. My mother sang from one end of the day to another. When childhood friends visited, they would say, your mother sings. I thought all mothers sang. My dad would say, your mother must think she's a bird. Although we used our apartment space well, my dad promised that one day we'd get our own private house. Sydney will have his own room, Ashley and Ernie will have their own rooms. 
Oh, daddy, 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 we'd exclaim, hopping up and down, thinking it would happen that very next week. However, it wasn't until the Second World War, when we were nine children all grown, that a private house across the street put up a for sale sign. My dad immediately went over there and made a down payment. My dad was so proud of this house that when people said to him, what people said to him, that when people said to him, I love your gray shingled house, he'd say, oh, that's not gray, it's Heather. I'd sit by the window of my room playing guitar, drawing from the familiar scene of my neighborhood across the street, congregating on the stoop and sidewalks of the apartment building in which we once lived. The seagulls flying above us remind us of my father's birds. Occasionally, one of his birds would escape the cage and wing its way through the apartment. We chased after that bird while cheering in its flight. The seagulls, however, soar free. My parents were born in Antigua, Antigua in the British West Andes. They had been childhood sweethearts. Soon after World War I, they immigrated to the United States and were married in New York City. My mother would say, if I hadn't married your father, I never would have married. In the English colonies, many young people were apprentices as, to a trade as part of their schooling. My dad was apprenticed to the printing trade. Yet at his first job in a downtown New York building, he was giving a mop and a broom. He didn't tell us about the prevailing racial discrimination that limited job opportunities for black people. He instead told us jokingly, how can I concentrate on the mop and broom with all those pretty legs going by? Still, he was determined to get a job in his trade, so he went to the British consulate and got a letter stating that he was a veteran of World War I. This led to a job with Moreno and Bellini printers in downtown New York. For me, the best part was that he would bring home a variety of papers left over from printing orders. I had so much to choose from for my artwork. When the Depression ended, the demand for the special work of these printers... Um, when Depression ended, the demand for the work, special work of these printers, my dad set up his own little printing shop. More paper. There's some more of his illustrations. Over a stony rise of the shore, we come down a sweeping curve of pebbly beach. In the distance, in a small island top to the lighthouse, a signal of caution to avoid the surrounding rocky shoals. I published my very first book in kindergarten. As we learned the alphabet, we drew pictures for each letter. When we reached the Z, the teacher gave us colored paper to make a cover for our alphabet picture. We sewed the pages together, and the teacher said, You have just published an alphabet book. You are the author, illustrator, and binder. Take it home. We became the distributors as well. After the alphabet book, we made number books, word books, books of whatever we learned. I got hugs and kisses and applause from family and friends for these books. The teacher called these rave reviews, and this inspired me to make gifts of books ever since. The local elementary school that I attended was PS2. The school was an amazing mix of languages and cultures, Black, Irish, Italian, German, Polish, and Jewish. I loved hearing the different languages and seeing the different things other children drew. These children were my classmates and friends from elementary school through high school. There was something else I loved about school. From the earliest grades, PS2 taught the practice of performing poetry. We would select a poem and practice it for weeks. Each morning, the class would begin with poetry, poetry recitation by two or three students. This understanding of poetry as performance art has never left me. It is at the heart of all of my work. Let's slow down and choose from the tied smooth so stones, some for our pockets and some to offer to others. Later, I'll take you to my favorite beach for collecting stones. We'll also select seashells, bones, driftwood, and sea glass as we go. When we were growing up, my mother read us stories from the Bible. There was a big church next to our school. Its stained glass windows glowed. Its bells rang on Sunday morning. We said, Mama, we want to go to that big pretty church. So one day, my mother took us to this church, St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church on Fulton Avenue and 169th Street in the Bronx. When I was a boy, the church held services in English and in German. The Sunday school superintendent, Mr. George Weidemeyer, welcomed us and we became the first black family to join that church. Pins were given annually for perfect attendance to the children and teachers of the Sunday school. The first year was a circle pin and then a wreath around the circle was added for the second year. After that, colorful bars indicated the years of perfect attendance added to the pin. I began earning my perfect attendance pins. 
I admired our teachers coming forward year after year, earning their bars for 10, 15, 20 years of perfect attendance. Can see the first, the second, and then three, four, five, six, seven. The bright blessed day, the dark sacred night, more illustrations. A shower, never mind, and see now a rainbow arches its band of color from the mountains to the ocean. No matter how often I get to see this, I gasp and wonder time and time again. I was 16 when I graduated from Theodore Roosevelt High School in the Bronx, but I could not go to college without a scholarship. With portfolio in hand, I was interviewed at one of the leading art institutes. The interviewer stated that mine was the best portrait that he had ever seen. However, he, was also, he also informed me that it would be a waste to give a scholarship to a black person. I remember my parents saying that if you're doing something creative and constructive, don't let anyone or anything ever stop you. I did not give up. I was able to take a postgraduate program in my high school and was advised to apply to the Cooper Union School of Art and Engineering the following summer. They do not see you there, my art teacher said, encouraging me. In 1940, the Cooper Union entrance exam was in three parts, drawing, architecture, and sculpture. When completed, we were sent our exam response in a tray with our names and addresses. The trays were placed on the platform of the Great Hall and we left. Since the evaluators literally did not see us, there was no way to determine the race of the applicants. I was fortunate to be accepted in to the art school, which was tuition free and still is. I was the only black student in my class. In fact, all through these school years, I had always been one of the few black students in my classes. I had learned early on to focus on my love of studies in art. At the Cooper Union, I could take courses in sculpture, calligraphy, design, book illustration, and painting. Painting became my greatest, great favorite. The Bronx community no longer reflects the diverse ethnic backgrounds of the people with whom I grew up. Today, the population is predominantly black and Hispanic. I still maintain my membership with the St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church, which stands today. In the 1990s, a fire started in the church vestry. Fortunately, it was stopped at the altar. However, a major stained glass window over the altar was destroyed. The church contra uh, contracted me to design a replacement for the resurrection windows. All of the images in the existing stained glass windows of the church pictured Caucasians in the scenes of the life of Jesus. For the replacement window, I designed a black Jesus rising from the tomb. A noted stained glass studio implemented my design, and the windows now takes its place with the others. There, a glint of blue sea glass. Broken bottles rolled and smooth, now smooth in our hands, remind of those stained glass windows of my childhood. You can see a stained glass window that he made. During the Depression, children often made their own toys. They made soapbox wagons with old carriage wheels, scooters with boards and skates. And so did I. Walking the streets, I'd pick up cast-off materials. I loved the challenge of finding ways of creating new forms from the pieces collected. It's like putting together a puzzle. My favorite thing to do with my sister, Ernstine, was to gather fabric sample books that had been discarded by upholstery stores. I would draw patterns of skirts and quilts and vests that my sister would sew together with a newfound cloth. We'd also help my dad make kites of intriguing shapes, squares, rectangles, boxes, out of vibrantly colored crepe paper, which we flew in the nearby park. Children crowded around us and asked to buy them. Soon we had an additional source of family income. Here's the town dock and the mailboat, our year-round connection to the mainland. The fisherman's co-op is next to the dock. Early morning, you'll see lobstermen sliding crates of fish bait down the ramps, loading them onto their boats. The inspiration that comes from collecting things has stayed with me my whole life. From the child who rescued stray objects from the streets, grew the adult who gathers seashells, driftwood, bones, rocks, and sea glass. Sea glass especially. I have jars and jars of it. As my sea glass collection grew, I felt challenged to find a way to join the pieces together. Holding them together in the shape of a ball or a star or a flower, since sea glass is irregular in shape, it's in thickness and thinness, I couldn't take the traditional stained glass approach. I couldn't use lead tracks, which require flat glass, to fit the tracks for soldering. So I experiments with paper mache. I soaked newspapers, pounded it into a clay pulp, and then added paste to the pulp. 
I set the sea glass pieces on tinfoil and connected the pieces with this pulp. When the mache dried, I peeled the tinfoil away and the mache held the, held the pieces together. When held to the light, the pieces glowed like stained glass. After making simple forms, I decided to make a small panel, 12 inches wide by 14 inches tall, of a scene from the life of Jesus. I drew the design, covered it with translucent wax paper, and then followed the design with glass pieces, holding them together with paper mache. When the panel dried, I reinforced the back with more mache and then painted it black. Held to the light, this was like a medieval stained glass window. This led to my series of glass panels in the life of Jesus. At the same time, I began creating mask-like heads from the bones, driftwood, and shells that I'd collected. These became hand puppets. A repertoire of company actors for staging my African folktale plays for the Islanders. Now we're back at my home. Here are my puppets and the sea glass panels. When you can see the promise and discarded things, you can make more of whatever you touch. I've always sought to create something useful, something beautiful, with objects that have been cast off or discarded. Here are those panels. I was 17 when I began my studies at Cooper Union. Two years later, I was drafted in the Army to serve in World War II. The Army was segregated, and the Black troops were generally assigned into service units. My assignment was to handle cargo, mainly at docks, with the 270 Port Company, 502 Port Battalion. A number of men knew the company had worked as stevedores. I knew nothing of dock work. Nevertheless, I was given the position of a winch operator and graded as a Tech Sergeant T4. On the basis of IQ ratings, I was also asked to attend officer candidate school. I refused. I had no ambitions about rank and was determined to stay with the men I had come to know. After basic training at Camp Miles Standish in Taunton, Massachusetts, we were assigned to work at the dockyards in Boston and were housed in a schoolhouse in South Boston. The neighborhood children were very curious about us soldiers and would often come to visit, sometimes walking the post with me when I was on guard duty. When I had days off, I brought art materials into the schoolyard and they'd come and draw with me. I missed them when our battalion sailed overseas to Scotland and even wrote them letters as I continued doing dock work in the port of Glasgow. Black soldiers were often restricted to the barracks after work to keep us from fraternizing with the white community. I'd heard that there was an art school in Glasgow and so I asked the battalion commander Colonel Pierce for permission to attend the Glasgow School of Art while I was not on duty. Some of the students there became friends. They invited me to their homes and churches and to theatrical events. At the Cooper Union in New York, we drew from live models. We were inspired by the impact of African art from the turn of the century on avant-garde European art. At the Glasgow School of Art, the students drew from plaster casts of Greek and Roman statues, formal drawings carefully rounded. I surprised my classmates with my swift sketches and exaggerated proportions of the body. All through the war years, I drew whenever I could. I kept a sketch pad and art supplies in my gas mask. There would have been a tumble of materials if I were ever in need of that mask. During a lull, I would take out my sketch pad and draw. I had great respect for the men in my union, and they supported my artwork. Because I was so inept at the winch, they often took over my winch operation post and said, Ashley, you draw. I also wrote love wrote lots of letters. Letters were reduced to a small size called V-mail. My Cooper Union friend, Evil Brussel, saved my war correspondences and recently sent them to me. Like what a gift to be able to reacquaint myself with that 19-year-old young man. In June 1944, we left Glasgow in a fleet that sailed for Normandy, France, and took part in the invasion, the June 6th surprise landing on Omaha Beach. Barrage balloons floated overhead to distract the bombers, but on a ship loaded with backup supplies, ammunition crates among them, it was a fearful time. There was a great loss of life before the beachhead was secured. Still, we pressed forward. Our secret weapon was a newly created vessel that was a boat on the water and a truck on land, the amphibi amphibious duck. We unloaded our cargo onto the ducks and went ashore, walking gingerly, hoping to avoid landmines and dug our foxholes. On that first day, I couldn't tighten the joint on my collapsible shovel. It kept closing on me. I dug down barely 12 inches by the time the evening strafing from the enemy plane started up, but I felt I had room to spare as I flattened out in the shallow space. The next day, one of my friends enlarged his foxhole and took me in. Here are some paintings about different people. 
like Langston Hughes and Eloise Greenfield. We'll watch our step as we watch the little cranberry beach, not because of any danger, but so as not to miss the rocks that we cannot live without. Offshore lobstermen at their marked buoys were hauling in the lobster traps. They check each catch to determine what might be kept and what will be thrown back into the ocean. The seagulls hover, ready to swoop down, discard at discarded bait and scraps. Lobsterman's round of traps completes their day. The war ended. My unit was terribly eager to finally go home, but the 270 port company did not return home as a unit, as other units have. Because of the segregation on ships, there were only a few places for black soldiers on each boat's homeward journey. We left France in dribbles of small, dispirited groups at a time. But once home, I was very happy and grateful to complete my study at the Cooper Union. That was in 1946, the year that the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in Central Maine was founded. The school awarded scholarships to art schools across the country to pull in the strongest artists. I was one of the two students at Cooper Union granted a summer scholarship. That summer of painting from the Maine landscape opened a whole new direction for me. I also learned the art of fresco there. We'd prepare a mixture of sand, plaster, and lime, which we'd spread on the wall. Then we mixed dry pigment with water and applied that on the damp wall. When the wall dried, the color was fixed permanently, a wonderful thing. Weekends, I often visited Acadia National Park. From Cadillac Mountain, I saw the beautiful Cranberry Islands off the coast. The Cranberry Isles would become my annual summer retreat, my most intensive time devoted entirely to painting. But that was all to come. I had experienced so much suffering of the war and tragedies of people caught in the war that I could not go straight on as a painter. Questions haunted me, especially why does man, knowing the overwhelming tragedies of war, choose war? I needed to find out. When I returned from Skowhegan, I enrolled as an undergraduate at Columbia University majoring in philosophy. Although there were no answers to my question, I was intrigued by systems of thought I stayed with the challenge and completed my undergraduate studies as a philosophy major. The seasons describe this island, spring, summer, autumn, winter. Some days in any season, we walk in fog so thick, so deep, we can scarcely see what lies ahead. But I didn't lose my need and love of painting. During my years at Columbia, I made appointments with publishers to show my art portfolio. Early in 1947, I met with Kurt and Helen Wolf, founders of Pantheon Books, who were putting together a book of African tales. They were immediately struck by the artwork that I had done for Aesop's Fables and Cooper Union. They thought this approach would be ideal for the art of the book. As each tale was complete, it was sent to me for illustrations. Every few months, I would bring in the art I was doing, and they were ecstatic. By the time of my 1950 graduation from Columbia, I had completed all of the art in this project, over 30 paintings in black and white and red and beige, and 50 black and white paintings, all in tempera, also called poster paint. After Columbia, I decided to devote myself to my work as an artist. I sailed for southern France to continue my art education under the GI Bill. The GI Bill, under the Department of Veterans Affairs, paid for further education studies for all veterans. In Aix Provence, I enrolled at the Université de Aix Marseille and studied French, but I spent most of the time painting. It was right at the time when the great cellist Pablo Castles, pursued by his, persuaded by his great musician friends, agreed to break his silence, a protest over the Franco regime in his native Spain, to honor the 200th anniversary of the death of Bach. Casals lived in the exile in the small Catalan town of Prats. He held a series of concerts in the great Baroque cathedral there. Musician friends came from all over the world to join him in honoring the great composer. Here's our island church for people of all religious backgrounds. It houses a small organ renovated and installed by the renowned organ builder Fisk. A week of concerts were given to the islanders by leading organists in celebration. When I heard that Pablo Casals would play in public again, I headed for the festival. Many rehearsals were held in the ruins of the St. Michel de uh, Cuxa Cloister, and I was able to draw unobserved musicians performing. The swift lines needed to capture the musicians rehearsed my, freed, rehearsing freed my hand. Later, I carried the rhythmic strokes and the drawings to the free brush strokes in painting the musical scene. Students were given free tickets to all the concerts, so I was also able to attend the first three Casals concerts. The closing of each Casals entered with a ended with a performance of the Catalan song of longing, El Cant dels Ochels. 
I made a little illustrated book of the song and sent it to him. Not long after, I was delighted to receive a very moving letter of thanks from him. During the summer, I painted, I paint outdoors. Ah, the irises are in bloom. I'll stop and paint them, you go and relax. When people see my paintings on exhibit, they often say, did you paint those in Antigua? They think only of the gray and rock-bound main coast, but are not aware of the riotous blossoming main gardens sport through their short flowering season. When I was in France, I received news from Pantheon Books that the Bulletin Foundation had bought the rights to Paul Radin's book of African tales and had decided to use photographs of African sculptures and masks to accompany the tests. The wolves were sorry so much that my imaginative illustri illustrations could not be used, and so was I. The possible opening to what had been my entry into the book field closed. It would be many years before that door opened again. When I returned to the Bronx in 1953, I began working full-time teaching art. I taught in many schools, including the Dalton's Lower School, before leaving the children for adults at Queens College. I used whatever time I had after work to paint in my studio. However, I continued to spend summers on the Cranberry Isles. In 1956, I returned to Skowhegan. I had won the annual competition to print a fresco in the South Solon Free Meeting House. Each year, an artist was selected to paint one of the walls in this meeting house until all the walls were frescoed. I decorated a curved back wall behind the central pews. My theme was the parable of the sower. Recently, I returned for the 50th anniversary celebration of the frescoes painted at the meeting house. The frescoes looked as fresh as they had the day they were painted. I returned home, longing to continue to be able to give all my days to developing as a painter. So I applied for a Fulbright grant and was fortunate in receiving the award of a Fulbright scholarship to Germany. I became a student at the University of Freiburg, I'm Breisgau in southern Germany, and studied German. I had always loved the poetry of Rainer Maria, Maria Rilke and had read at home in uh, German-English translations. I even memorized the English versions of my favorite. I brought these bilingual books with me to Germany and worked through German poetry to get a grasp of the rhythms of that language. After almost 50 years, these poems in German are still vivid in my memory. And as always, I painted. I sketched in the marketplace that formed each day around the Freiburg Cathedral and later painted from these drawings in my room. I became so absorbed in painting the marketplace scenes that I applied for a renewal of the scholarship and was able to stay in Germany for a second year. Let's join the 4th of July picnic in the town field. The island's year-round population of 80 people swells to over 400 with summer cottages occupied, so we have a wonderful celebration. Later in July, we'll join the Maypole dance. Upon my return from Germany, I rented a studio on Tremont Avenue in the Bronx. From my windows, I'd draw children playing when the streets were closed off at noon recess. Many of my drawings for the dancing granny were based on these drawings. My younger sister, Emerald's five children, attended a public school near my studio. My parents had taken Emerald and her children into their home when her marriage ended. I pitched in to help. The children came by after school and I drew and painted them. They ran around the studio and I was always calling, come back, come back, come back to the pose. I began teaching art again and the major portion of my earning went to supporting the children. Their posing for me balanced with my care for them. Let's cut through these woods. Just beyond that aisle of trees, you'll see some of my favorite cove. From the rising mound of boulders, a gathering of cormorants stretch and air their wings. Across the ocean, the mountains of Acadia National Park on Mount Desert Island line the shore. Take it all in, and below us look down and choose from the varied shapes and colors of stones and treasured stories of the millennia. In 1962, Jean Carl, an editor at Anthem Publishers, heard of my work and came to my studio in the Bronx. She enjoyed the oil painting of my family, but she kept returning to the table with my book projects, Aesop's Fables, Mother Goose Rhymes, and the African folk tales that I'd create for the wolves at Pantheon. She was excited by the different styles I used to illustrate the various texts. I told her that I was inspired by the cultures of the world and celebrated those influences in my work. Soon after, she left my studio and sent me a contract to begin a project for her. Our first book was a collection of poems by Rabin Duranth, Tagore, Moon for Who Do You Wait? Now my books would no longer be one of a kind, but printed in the thousands. For my next book project, 
Sheen asked to use my African folktale illustrations that had so impressed her in my studio. I told her that those illustrations were done from documented text that preserved the story motif but had little relation to the oral tradition of African storytelling. But Jean was determined. So, Ashley, tell the stories in your own words, she told me. To get the spirit of the oral tradition from my writing, I practiced reading aloud from the Black Americans' poets, from Paul Lawrence Dunbar to Langston Hughes to Nikki Giovanni. I then retold the African tales using the good ideas from poetry in my writing. I hope this would open the ear to the sound of the voice in the printed world, so that even when reading my story silently, readers would hear the voice of a storyteller. And that led to my retelling of African tales. For my Langston Hughes, Carol of the Brown King tempera paintings, my inspiration was French illuminated manuscripts. The block print illustrations for my first book, of Spirituals, Walk Together Children, and for I'm Going to Sing, were inspired by the early religious block printed books. And folk art inspired watercolors I created for The Night Has Ears, a collection of African proverbs. As years went by, I used the money I earned teaching and making books to help my sister Emerald raise her children. I continued this support until they were grown and on their own. No sooner had this happened than when the newly established art department at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire, invited me to teach. I was working closely with the students at Dartmouth at all levels of drawing, painting, and design. During this time, my book work increased, and I was frequently invited to give talks about my books. In the late 80s, I decided to leave Dartmouth and finally give all my time to my own work. It was then that I chose to make the Cranberry Isles rather than New York City my year-round home. After so many books together, Jean Carl suddenly became ill in the winter of 1999 and died a year later. For almost a year, I put my book projects aside. I focused on my painting outdoors. I painted huge canvases of the flowers from my garden. I also worked on sea glass panels and puppets created from beach vines. Then my new editor at Anthem, Caitlin Deloy, pers persuaded me to bring in the stories that I had been working on with Jean Carl. We selected Beautiful Blackbird, and when she saw my first double-page spreads in collage, a medium I'd not yet used in my books, she encouraged me to create all of the art for Blackbird out of cut paper. I love painting outdoors from the landscape when the weather permits. Later in the day, I return to my studio and work on my book projects. At times, I turn my energy to work on a puppet or a glass panel. Each activity taps into a different level of energy that allows me to extend my working day. I don't regard visits of family and friends as interruptions. Everything feeds into the days, which feels big here. In response to the flow of events, I hope to validate time and my life. Here are some of the titles of books that Ashley Bryan illustrated. I was the first in my family to visit Antigua. Although my relatives had vi visited Antigua with their children, my family had not. I stayed with the family of my mother's brother. His home was near the open market of St. John's. I'd sit by the window, draw and paint from the scene. The features of the people continually reminded me of my family at home. Darrings from the tropical landscapes later became the basis for the illustrations in my African tales. I also spend hours on the, f the many fine beaches and the cool sea. My parents had not planned to return to Antigua, but as they neared retirement age, I urged them to visit. They made the trip and were happy to have returned. My uncle, who built houses, offered them land that he owned on the hill outside the main town of St. John's. My parents sent money so that he could build the house that became their permanent home. That freed them to retire. Once there, my parents reveled in the climate and the view from the veranda, the coming and going of cruise ships, freight ships, and small crafts in the bay. My mother could now indulge in her love of plants. The ground surrounding the house became a glorious garden with mango, coconut palm, and citrus trees as well. My parents have since died and are buried in, in Antigua. The family house remains overlooking the harbor. I return regularly to the island, always with my sister Elaine, who is a great cook. It's evening. I've enjoyed walking the island with you, telling my story. My studio window gives a perfect view of the sunset, moving from one breathtaking moment to another as the first stars appear. The night continues as the day had, full of possibilities. I was in my early 20s when I came to the Cranberry Islands and when I visited my family home of Antigua. For over 50 years, these islands have inspired my work. I love encouraging children and adults to make art almost as much as I love making art myself. Teaching art became early for, came early for me. 
I was in my teens when the church I attended gave me the room and materials for art classes, saying, you have a talent, share your gifts with others. I have tried to do so ever since. The Ashanti tribe have a saying that they used to end their African tales, which is just right for me to close mine with. This is my story. Whether it be bitter or whether it be sweet, take some of it elsewhere and let the rest of it come back to me. And that is the end of Ashley Bryan's story. Um, words for my life song. I hope you enjoyed learning about this uh, very long-term Maine resident who has created these beautiful works of art that um, inspired by our state and inspired by his history um, that continue in, to inspire us to this day. Once again, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. Thank you for listening and I hope to see you soon.